Console log, that's good. Console log, okay. that's good. Console uh, log. Yeah. You can switch to screen sharing in settings of the hangout. Sorry for all the technical stuff. Sorry for all the technical stuff. Uh, how do I do that? Uh, how do I do that? <coughs> screen share. Yeah. Screen share. Just screen what I'd like to share. Hide. Hide. 
I love maths. They're really I love great. Maths. They're really they work. great. <laughs> Is that showing up anywhere? That's showing up anywhere? It's showing up there. It's showing up there. <laughs> <laughs> Our audience on the internet are having a great time with it. Yeah. Should we eat? You are screen sharing. You are screen sharing. Yeah. Screen sharing. Very screen sharing. Very little. Shall I use display <laughs> more? Display more memory, rather. Yeah. 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 No, it's not. Yeah. So I need to stop screen sharing. So I need to have to break it. Should be on there too. Yeah. Matt, look perfectly on the screen. You only your talk. You only your talk. Just try one more time. Jamie White, who was MVP of this group next month, is building a, uh, he's building a, an application both and for and for the apps, which is uh, 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 So um, uh, uh, I just wanted to. Um, there's been lots of talk within the Ember uh, people have maintained the Ember project. Uh, yeah. That you know, reacting would well be used within Ember to do their sort of new stuff. Um, and also, you know, there's lots of things that we can learn from each other's frameworks. Um, I know there's a lot of frameworks around. Um, so, the first. How do I go off the next slide? <laughs> so, not why am I here? Why was I there last week? <laughs> um, <laughs> a colleague of mine, um, Howard Van Moyen, told me once that every developer should learn a new language every year. And I think it's the same with frameworks and all sorts of things. Like the more you can learn about like, what other people are doing and the way other people do things, um, the, the better a perspective you have on the way you do things. And even if you never ever use um, Envoy, if they have never ever used React, and they're not very because I know that. But, um, but uh, it gives you a different perspective. And, um, Learning functional programming, for instance, gives you a massively different outlook on um, on the way you write software. Basically. So I think there's benefit in uh, in learning new stuff, and also the software that we write these days is like polyglot. It's mishmash all sorts of bits from all over the place. Building, assembling. We don't actually write software very much. We just assemble stuff like Lego blocks, right? So. Um, so 
and, to, and applications typically made up with loads of things. And so it can be made up with React and Ember, or it can be made up with React and Backbone, or it can be made up with React and a whole collection of other things. Um, so it's it's um, quite uh, common to have like different parts of your application um, address quite different uh, things, and I think that overall, together, obviously, got that from the Scott thing. Um, so that was advertising this, and um, what is React? So Facebook, quite. Oh yeah. So the reason I'm giving this talk today, right, apart from saying why, is because it. Feedback in from the first two um, was uh, like why we need more, like a more general high level introduction to React, and um, I kind of wanted to sort of deep dive straight away and get hands out email and that sort of stuff. And um, and I, my first reaction was well, nobody would be here if they didn't already know React or were interested in it or you know all that sort of stuff. Um, but still, there was like more comments asked me about like um, can we have a high level introduction? This is Kind of going to be it, I suppose. So, um, oh yeah, so Facebook call it a library rather than a framework. I think it's quite important actually because it doesn't get in the way, it's just there. So, some people say it's the V and MVC. I don't necessarily agree with that because um, MVC was not quite a minute. Um, might not be as relevant in the real world. Uh, there's already too many UI frameworks, and there's already too much of that, and you know, these problems just seven times over. And, why invent another thing when you can use all the stuff you've got already? Um, just it complicates the landscape. Um, but one thing that is quite common these days is for people to prefer components over the template. So the typical view stuff in MVT, whether it's server side or client side, but templates, there's hundreds of templates in languages. And um, most people tend to think that the future of the web, or a lot of people tend to think the future of the web is in components. And um, so it's a whole web component thing, and we have components, and has components now, and the directives are components effectively. And you know, there's also sort of like component based development the future of them. Um, state is a killer, um, and the more state you have, the, the harder the hard it is to manage, and managing the state throughout your application. Um, is a real problem, and look at that. How that is just by React. Um, and a lot of people think that two-way data binding is complex, overly complex, um, and and so when you've got lots and lots of data bindings going on, imagine what happens when this changes because that ripple effect can go right through your application and it's difficult to predict what's actually going to happen. And then some people say don't make logical presentation and React comes in because of that. But, I think it's a different type of separation of concerns in the sense that um, stuff is more functionally separated rather than being your templates are here, your scripts are there, your um, you know, controls are here, and your apps are there, and all that sort of stuff. Um, though that sort of separation is a little bit more artificial in the way, and these think React components, or any components, um, allow you to be much more, uh, allow you to have separation of concerns in a functional way, which I think is better. So React defies conventional wisdom. It's out there. Right? It's different. Um, and they say it yeah, it's very famous saying give it five minutes. Um, everybody I've known that has given it five minutes has uh, loved it and um, see immediately um, how simple and quick it is to learn. And I think it's it's simple. And because it's simple, it becomes easy quite quickly. Whereas in something like Angular, which is quite um, complex, it becomes easy much later on. So you've already put like, loads of effort into it before it becomes easy. Um, React becomes easy. So that's great. Brilliant. Um, really complex interactions in your application become easy to reason about. So it's actually quite easy to um, think about what your application should do at any point in time. Because you kind of freeze time when you're writing your application. So um, it's just like, if my data looks like this, then my view um, looks like this. And if someone does this, then this happens. And it's always like, if this, then that, which is um, quite straightforward. Um, 
It's not intrusive. You can build little lines of React, and you don't have to take, doesn't have to take over everything. It's actually very fast compared to you know, what you'd expect. Um, and I thought this was out there because this guy, Schlaefer, or whatever, why you might not need MVC with React. It's actually quite interesting. Um, and it kind of <coughs> almost. Uh, so what about web components? Well, this quote by Peter Hunt is actually brilliant because I'm going to read it actually. There's a lot of stuff you get for free when you build like the browsers into this. And this <coughs> one thing that distinguishes React from web components and Polymer and that kind of thing, they're getting closer and closer in the browser and we're getting further and further away from the browser. And I think that actually is more sustainable than long time. So we'll talk about in a bit that um, React kind of uses this render, uh, browser as a as a rendering engine, and it sort of like steps right away from it. Um, so that's quite handy because it's no longer dependent on whether the browser is implemented. Like web components, um, there's polyfills and stuff, and you can go back a certain distance um, before it breaks, and, and you can you can build applications on web components very probably, but but um, they're forever like limited by whether a browser this browser supports this feature and that browser supports that feature. Um, and React is really, really good at slipping away from it, providing a layer over the top that says, I don't care which browser it is, forget which browser it is, we're going to provide a uniform thing over the top, which is good. And it's all down to the virtual DOM. Um, so it's expensive to update, you know that. I'm going to fly through this because you all know this. Um, so we build a lightweight DOM representation, which um, it's actually cheap to update. So um, what we can do is build a, um, in the virtual DOM, we can have a, a render function. In each component, we can have a render function, which takes some data and returns a some virtual DOM. So a component like an H1 or something, you can take some attributes or some, or some props and, some, and can make, have some internal state. Um, but basically, you, you give it some data and it produces some virtual DOM. So if you've got a whole hierarchy of components, you can feed some data right on the top and you get a hierarchy of virtual DOM. And then if you give it some different data, you get a different virtual hierarchy. Um, and then if you compare the virtual DOM that you got from the first render with the virtual DOM that you got from the second render, then you can create the minimal set of changes that you need to update the real DOM, which is expensive to update. And that is it, right? That's all there is to react, really. Um, but the interesting thing that you get from this is that if you do the diff the other way around, you get like a free undo. So it's all about moving your application state forward in time or backwards in time, and whether um, you compare this version with the next version or the next version with the previous one, you can move back. That opens up all sorts of possibilities that would be quite interesting in the future. Things like, for instance, um, you know, you have a problem. What what had you done to get to that problem? And you could potentially rewind the user all the way back to the things they've done or whatever. Quite interesting. Um, so the diffing is fairly straightforward, but optimized like crazy. So, but it's done on level per level. So. Um, <coughs> It's very. It's not very often that things move like complete places in the tree. So it's not very often that this this node down here, for instance, would actually move up there or whatever. So um, what, what React does is it compares just on on the level, and if the text in this node had changed, um, and then it, when it did the diff, it would know that it, what it had to do was um, something like that. And there, there's some quite complex stuff in there, but um, but it's basically that the Big O notation of n to the power of 3, which is what it would normally be, is reduced to almost like 2. Sometimes it's um, simplified by all the optimizations that have been. Um, so, state and props. Um, props, do you think about the virtual DOM as just an ordinary web page, actually, the real DOM elements? So, attributes on in real DOM elements are very similar to props in virtual DOM. Um, same sort of thing. They're passed into the component. 
um, and their immutable limit change. Um, you can pass new props in, but they don't change the subject line. Um, they're passed in by the parent component. And for instance, class name is built in, it's expanded, it's a custom property. Um, and then internally, in, within the component, you've got some state. And the state is internal and should be kept on asset minimum because remember the state is bad. Um, and if necessary, it's managed by a common ancestor. So if you if you um, want to change, you, you want these two things to interact in a different parts of the hive, either common ancestor would be where you manage the state. And we'll talk about how we can um, <coughs> improve that in the future. Can just show you. So these are the um, methods within React that allow you to deal with state and problems. So get initial state. If the initial state of the component is returned by this function. There's also set state, so if you want to change the state of the component, you would call this function. And um, force update, um, if you want to force a re-render without, without having changed the state. So if you, if you change the state on the component, then it and all its children will re-render anyway. If you call force update, then um, force that's happening. Should component render is an optimization um, function that if it returns false, then that part of the tree won't, yeah, won't be touched. So you can, if you know that the data hasn't changed, then you can um, improve the performance of your application by returning false from that. So when a node, when a node, when set state is called on a node, it's effectively dirty, and in the next render pass, it and its children will be re-rendered. But should component update will be called on each node to see whether it needs to go crawling down further. Um, so what does it look like? Um, in JavaScript, the virtual DOM looks like this. So that is um, this basically static method function on uh, React component component um, allows you to render a, render a React component into an element in the DOM. So we're creating um, an H1 from Virtual from the virtual DOM. Um, we're not passing in any props, and we're, it's, it has one child, which is a string, which is hello world. Um, and we're rendering that virtual DOM element into um, a real DOM, or so that's a placeholder effectively for the app. So that's what it looks like in JavaScript, which is a bit messy. You can imagine by the time you've got big complex um, component trees, it could be really, really messy. So, Facebook invented JSX, which is like a JavaScript with XML-like syntax in it, um, which gives more sort of HTML-like familiarity, and it is quite like HTML. The idea being to get to designers involved, I don't know if that actually works or whether um, it does that. But um, it kind of is familiar, it looks a bit weird to get used to, I think. Um, but it is definitely read more readable than, that, than the JavaScript. Thing because when you nest with code braces and all that sort of stuff, it gets really messy and you grow very quickly. That stays much more, it's much cleaner. Um, I very much we use LiveScript because it's much even more cleaner still, we think. Um, so that's exactly the same code um, as that. You can basically strip out all the stuff you want and you can actually be really functional with it as well, which is great. Um, so this is a typical component that looks like it's a task component, which you've seen before, I've to show the first news group. But um, that uh, is it, uh, an unnumbered list of two list items in it, um, two tabs effectively. One is active if the shopping list is delivery, and the other is active if the shopping list is collection. And it does that by setting uh, status classes, and there's an anchor inside which has got an H for to translate the string. Um, and that's it, really. There's some the helpers mixing at the top is to provide the translation and the link. Um, well, a whole bunch of other functionalities that, to um, support stuff um, to the component. And the display name so that you can um, view it look like inside in the browser um, React. Which is really cool. um, and this is a more, comp a more complete DOM. We've still only got a render method, so it's still actually quite simple. But there, there's a, an HTML header. Um, with a class name and a cookie policy series, um, only present if 
become a config on how it says that it's a cookie policy. Um, and you can see that the, that div there has got um, it's, it's got this anchor for sure, right? So that this this if says if that's true, then add this as a child, and that we get some of the that's our view. But I mean, you can see how easy it is to use by <coughs> because this is the data that's passing from the parent, and if if we should show a cancel, then we show the cancel. Link. And <laughs> it's really easy to think about this. Um, so each component has like a life cycle in it, and um, there's a handful of life cycle methods that happen during the life cycle, lifetime of the component. It, it will map, it did map, it will receive props, like I, the parent is passing the new data through the props. Um, should the component update, which we talked about, so you can, you can check whether this props is different to next props, or this state is different to next state, and return true or false, um, if you know better than reactors about whether it should explore all, all the child components to see whether they can change. Um, component will update before it um, is updated. We did update and will on that. And that's it. Not much to say about those. Very rarely use any of them. Um, they are useful sometimes. Component did mount any runs on the client, doesn't run on the server. Um, yeah. Not much to say about them, really. Very straightforward. Um, so the Data flow through a React app runs from the top to the bottom, um, and from a parent to child by its props. And you can consider that that's a bit like one way data binding in the sense that the UI is, built, is reacting to the data that's passing to it. And if you want to pass data up the other way, um, you can pass callbacks down. Um, so if the user clicks on something, you can call the callbacks all the way up and do whatever it needs to do. And that's kind of a bit like to a bit. I guess most people don't build um, stuff like that necessarily, because there are some better alternatives. Uh, like one of them is the security event system, so events bubble up. So you can, I mean, you can attach handlers onto stuff, um, and, and React will do the right thing with uh, delegated events and stuff. But or you can sort of like listen at the top and let that stuff bubble up. Um, and then there's Flux as well, which um, there's a pattern, an architectural pattern, which Chris would have devised, which allows you to have a one-way data flow around your application. So you can put, so you risk respond to actions and send those actions to a dispatch. It's a bit like a pub sub thing with store. Um, this is to that data and more, changes its models and all that sort of stuff. When it's finished, it says, I've changed. And the view says, OK, thanks, you've changed. I'll re-render everything. And it refills the whole application. And then if the user interacts with some of their app, Action go around it. Um, in practice, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So, um, you may have like a web API and some Ajax stuff, and so that creates actions. The React is the bottom can create actions. Um, those actions are dispatched to all the stores, and like multiple stores, um, which have registered using callbacks. And when they've all updated, um, then events are sent back to tell the React use to say, right, go ahead and remember. Um, Pete Hunt, in this great talk, actually, at uh, JSCoff EU 2030, at 20 minutes and 8 uh, seconds into that, he, um, I'm not going to play now, but he, um, <laughs> got very bored, uh, more bored than you are now, um, and he talks about um, how the React uh, rendering engine is a little bit like the Doom 3 engine. So he uses this slide, which is, um, how the Doom engine works, right? So I did attempt in the first thing to talk about that, and I got some soft to rest. So this is a bit, of, <laughs> a bit better, maybe, um, illustration of how um, you've got your world, um, which has got all the state and all the people and what they're doing, and all everything, right? And you've got the logic, which creates an inter intermediate representation of the scene. And, um, from that, you basically render that scene, creating a whole load of OpenGL instructions, which you send flush to the graphics card, and that does all the rendering. So um, if you overlay what, how React works in a similar sort of thing, is that it treats the browser just like a graphics card, effectively. 
So we start with that, our app state and events, and we create um, React components which generate virtual DOM, and they compute them in all set of DOM operations and flush them to the browser. Um, which is quite cool. Um, we're running quite a few isomorphic applications at the moment, which is really good because because of the virtual DOM doesn't have any dependency on the real DOM at all, it could you can call render component to string instead of render component. And when you call render component to string, you get an a, a string of HTML on the back, um, it's called the DOM, um, which you can send down to the client. And when you send it down to the, when it's sent down to the client, it has a checksum on the root element, and then you render the render it again on the client. This time, instead of calling render component to string, you call render component. And you inject that DOM into a placeholder in the real DOM. And what React does is it creates another checksum. And if those two checksums are the same, then it just attaches the event handles and allows you to carry on the client side. If, if the um, checksum is different, it does actually correct the DOM that the browser has rendered and give you a warning to say you probably didn't really intend this. Um, but the great thing is that if you're carrying on your client side, you can press refresh on any route, and the server will render your. Well, the server will do exactly the same thing, but it, it's calling render component to string. So when we write applications that we're now, we just write a we write components, and those components run on the server, they run on the client. Um, when you're writing a component, you don't know, you don't care whether it's the server or the client. Um, they have exactly the, the same environment. As, um, available to them, whether they're in the browser or in the server, and we, we do that by passing the data that they need down to down to them. Um, but essentially, the application itself doesn't know or care whether it's running in the server or the client, which means that any route, you know, the server routes are on the client as well, the client routes are on the server as well. You can refresh any route, and the server will render that route. Um, and then once you've got it, um, you can go on, carry on going forward. So you get a non-JavaScript for free. So if you turn the JavaScript off, uh, you basically just carry on because this, but, but the server just renders all the routes instead. So there's obviously if the JavaScript is off, the client-side router can't work. So those routes go to the server instead, and the server just renders that state, and you carry on. We're, we're actually writing an application at the moment which um, runs really poorly on iPhone three. Yes. Yeah, and like, I picked one up today, and like, it's so old-fashioned already. But um, it doesn't work really well on that because the JavaScript engine is too slow. And um, so we're looking at turning JavaScript off for those devices. I just, I just think that's insane, isn't it, right? Because it's like, surely JavaScript's going to help on end of it. The engine is too slow, really, for react on those devices. So, um, but the great thing is that if you turn it off completely, you actually get a better experience, which is really weird, um, but it's true. Um, and your application gets faster and your actual startup because the HTML that the browser that you need to show to you to your user comes down the wire, so the browser can render that straight away. So even if the script takes a little while to get there or a little while to start up, you don't notice because by the time you come to interact with the page, it's already there. But you can see the page. So straight away, regardless of which route, so if you deep link into your application, you still get that page rendered by the server. Sort of. That's kind of like the holy grail of web applications, I think. And of course, it's SEO friendly, so um, you don't need to do um, what a lot of people do is just run your single page application on the server in PhantomJS just for searching. Um, I know a lot of people have got a bit cleverer than Phantom using some cheering and stuff for lightweight DOM, DOM generators again to do. But um, you still have to spin up your application on the server and you still have to do all that which doesn't. Uh, what we did was create um, a view engine for Express which um, actually just renders components. So um, in exactly the same way as if they were a JV or whatever. So it was kind of um, we work, we're, we're passed in basically a, a layout function which could be a mod J view or something like that, and it works with locals. And then we just render the component to a string. So we're creating the instance of that component using the data that we're given on the locals and render it to a string. 
and then that is injected onto the locals so that when we actually call the layout function for those locals, um, it will render the right HTML to the client. So, 10 lines, 20 lines of code for your engine for React. And this is how you might use it. This is slide script, sorry, uh, but that's all time. So, we've created an express route to declaring a root called, um, which is uh, just a nice word of it. And it calls the API to get the products, and when it comes back, um, we render that React having I mean, a hierarchy of React components, which is in that product's product details um, file, and we pass in the data we got back from the API. You know, so, so quite straightforward to use. Um, so very quickly, I'm going on. Um, a lot of the interesting React at the moment is around what happens when you give a guarantee to a React that the data you're passing in is immutable. Because if you can say that, then React can do all sorts of amazing things to, if you help it, to, um, to make it really efficient at creating the virtual DOM hierarchies. And um, this is one of the things that OM does. So OM is, um, I should talk about in a second, actually. Um, Written by the same guy as in wrote ClojureScript um, and And also Mori, which is like a subset of ClojureScript, which is loads of it. Um, it's basically all of the data structures from ClojureScript. And which is the same as Clojure, obviously. Um, and Immutable JS, which Facebook just released, which um, recently, which uh, is a lighter weight version of Mori, effectively, but also immutable data structures, but more sort of JavaScript friendly, if you like. Um, but if you can, um, if you use like Mori or Immutable JS to create um, immutable data structures, and then you pass them into React, um, you can get all sorts of benefits. So David Nolan um, wrapped React um, or on. Um, he, wrapped, he wrapped it for use in ClojureScript. But because ClojureScript has immutable data structures quite involved, and they use the base sharing, so they're really actually efficient. It's maybe a little bit more garbage, but they're very fast and very memory efficient. Um, but basically, you get a new copy of, every single, of, of the object every single time it changes. So, so that gives React, you can guarantee to React that, that it will get a completely brand new object if any of it's changed. Um, then you can just do a quick, quick reference equals to see whether it has got the same object. And if it has, it doesn't need to do any kind of checking. So if it's got a different object, it knows that something below has changed, so go down to the next level. Are you the same? Are you the same? Are you the same? No, I'm different. Oh, yes, I'm the same. It doesn't have to change. So it actually massively speeds up that process. Not that it's slow anyway, um, but like we were just saying, you know, on an iPhone 3 GS, yes, it actually might, on might work better than React, because when you haven't got um, a very fast JavaScript engine, then you, you know, building the DOM, virtual DOM, being. Um, so, by returning false in should component update, or if should, should component update basically just contains a, um, a check for reference quality, then um, it can massively improve that. And also on users' request animation frame to do its rendering. So 60 frames a second in that 16 millisecond uh, window that it gets, it can do all its updates, which is really quite cool. Um, so we actually do that by default, but on does. And, um, because it can, because it can get all this really fast DOM diffing, but you know, it can work out exactly what it should and shouldn't need to check. Um, it can quite happily render quite complex applications inside the simulation, which is great. Makes the application really responsive. Uh, yeah, it's all over the place. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this square pixel. It's pretty cool. That's really nice. Got to play with it. That's it. Why do you think that knowledge is finished so bad and hard? I'm quite used to knowledge state, so I would like to know why you think it's so hard. So um, I think anything that changes, anything that changes over time is difficult to manage, right? Like, um, 
one of the things that I quite like about React is that you don't time almost comes out of the equation. So data changing over time is not a problem because um, you just have to think about what would it, what it would do if it was like that. So like you froze time and said, um, I want to render a UI based on this data. It's never going to change. So and the UI's always got to run it. Um, and then when you, when the state of the deprivation moves on, you just like render a new UI and, and that never changes. John means it's kind of like freeze time all the time, which I think is really, really helpful um, because state change, changing over time is like an extra dimension and you have to have in your head, um, which I think can lead to all sorts of difficulties. I mean, I don't know. Minimizing the amount of state, the amount of change that happens in your application, I think, seems to make it easier. I find it a lot easier to write because I don't think about state so much. Anymore. Okay, it's nice about nice. like, like what, what the UI would look like if the data looked like that. So. The way to explain it is that um, you never, your application is never just the state of it, it's always state and something else. So when the state changes, you have to manually figure out, okay, that that change in the state happens. What else do I have to do? Does that have to be why? Have to do something else. If you can take that off and say, okay, just the state changes, and then some people figure those updates out for me, that's a massive win. You just like drop off part of your work, maybe more. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, by splitting that apart, by sort of by cleaving the state away from. Any, um, so you write your UI to behave this way, given the state, whether it's state or props, whatever it is. And then on the other, on the, on the other half of your you can think about how, this, so your state engine becomes much, much, much smaller, and it just has to think about how, how it doesn't have, to, doesn't have to consider the UI. So, so you, know, you just render your page once, and that's all you need. I guess it's because, this is because when any of that state changes, all of your application is redrawn. So you, you effectively just send a single event that says, I've changed. It doesn't say what's changed. It doesn't say how it's changed. It doesn't say anything. And the other end doesn't have to think, doesn't have to care. Either it's just, I've changed. And the whole set of your application is really fucked. And so the whole um, way your application looks is just really happy. So when you actually, the engine or the core of your application doesn't really care about that. It's just it's like that separation is quite nice. Another benefit is also the debugging. So if a user encounters an error, you can send the state back to the current state of the application. Then you can use that locally to replicate that state and see what's wrong with the state. That's also good. Yeah, I mean, that's what one thing that just very often get talked about is testability, right? Because remember when Angular came out, there's this big thing made of about how easy it is to test um, and the um, directors and stuff. And it's true, they are, you know, they're also step forward. But no one ever really talks about how easy it is to test React applications. Um, but it's so easy because like, the render function is, is um, if you wanted to test at this level, the render function is pure. So given x, it will always produce y. Um, so there are no side effects, and anything with no side effects is easy to test because you don't, you know, you test, you don't have to consider anything outside the function. But the rest of the world doesn't exist. Just call the function. It gives me this. You can give it loads of different things and test it always produces well. Easy to test. Just call. But no one ever talks about that. I don't know. Have you um, delved into the flux? So, yeah, um, I think the whole, I think the, the view part of React is incredibly mature already, but the rest of it is, is very mature, I think. Um, it's partly because React doesn't really attempt to say much about how you build your application and build it with all sorts of things. But I think they just said, right, um, this is how we do it on Facebook or Instagram. And um, so Flux came out, 
and it's really just a pattern. It's not. And there are some examples. So, like in one of the apps we're running, where we did take the dispatcher code from one of the examples. <coughs> in that we end up sort of using that. Um, the stores are all custom, and but we do follow the pattern, um, but not as complex. I mean, we don't we don't go to all of the um, events that they go to. So it's a bit simpler. But yeah, I mean I think overall it's a good pattern. I think one of the problems is that it kind of breaks the component componentized model of things I anymore. Mean, I mean I guess a component just has an interface with the world, right? So if you give it this, um, it will draw this and it behaves as you know, it can emit this event these messages of it to the dispatcher. So I suppose it doesn't do that respect because you know you can still have an interface with the world. So and it can still be quite well specified. But, but um, by having this sort of like one way data thing that trickles down the top, ripples down your UI, and then events and generate actions that go up, um, kind of um, the components sort of like need that to survive. Not because they're not really great. I, I don't know. I, mean, I like it. It works well for us, but I think it's kind of general. I don't know what's going to happen. So it's still very good. Yeah, I mean, I guess like this is what this is why I'm interested to go to the end of this group because uh, they do have lots of verses and um, so you know there's some synergies there that we can all. But if you're um, re-rendering the lightweight DOM every render, is there uh, an issue with object allocation, creating new trees every time, or is that not a problem with that? Uh, yeah, I think it is. But I don't think it's a problem. It actually has a pool of objects no, that exactly. we use. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't seen. We've been blindly using React in a big application for a while, and we've never, apart from on really old devices, we've not had any problem with memory allocation or garbage collection or CPU utilization. It's not, it's not ideal. Um, but yeah. I think it's, there's lots of optimizations in there um, to stop it generating so much. You, you found out that the issue is always the DOM. Mm -hmm. you know, if you want to render a table with 10,000 rows in it with 10 columns, yeah. you actually, on a modern workstation, if you're doing your mobile, it's different. If you're doing it on, on the desktop PC, that's fine. You can't display that. You know, it'll yeah. take the browser like, a second and a half, two seconds, chugging away, trying to think what to do with that and rendering all these spots. And, you know, it's the same as trying to render 10,000 for a table on the screen when you're going to make that in a scroll thing or paginated a table or something. But React can keep up with a virtual DOM with that, but rendering it into the real DOM is the problem. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. I mean, if you think about what the browser is actually doing, like all the reflowing and repainting and the calculation of all the CSS, it's really easy. Um, whereas the virtual DOM is just like some almost like really lightweight JavaScript objects that don't have any weight to the top in there. These are light. Cool, great. Okay. Um, I'm sorry about the mess at the beginning. Do um, you want to do that one? Yeah. Um, or just give back to you. Yeah, maybe a break to get set up. Should we have a five minute break? There's lots of tea stuff. Oh, yeah, it's all right. <laughs> Yeah, I 
Yeah, so provided I don't actually try to say hide the thing that says screen, screen one, share. But I don't try and deal with that thing. That seems to break everything. Right. I think that's everything working. Okay, I think we need to shout No. Don't touch okay, hi. I think we've got it all working now. Okay. I'm waiting for people to sit down. Just I wanted to ask questions so that I can dial in, so I can I can ask I can give the right kind of talk. Do we want something really high level? Do we want like lots of detail about how we've kind of done stuff? Do we want um, of information about immutability, or just a mix of all of those things? Simple. How many people want to really high level? Why the hell did we react? How would we use React? Why was it a good choice for us? And how many people want like super low level? Okay. Right, so there'll probably be a mix of both of those things. That's easy enough to do. If, if you're, for too many of you look forward, I'll try to move on. If too many of you don't uh, look like you don't understand what I'm doing, I'll hopefully try to slow it down because I can't talk very. So, uh, might as well just get going. So, who am I? My name is Brad Shuttleworth. I work at Move. Right we're down there. We make business cards. We make we do printed stuff, beautiful printed things. Land works wonders. So, website. We have yeah we obviously we have a website on which you can go and you can do lots of design stuff and you can make that. Um, so talk today is about printing with React. So um, I don't know if anybody here has actually used Move before. Um, cool. Uh, if you have uh, and you've encountered our wonderful very large Flash application uh, that has lots of history, it's nice and slow. It doesn't work on most of the devices you guys own. Uh, certainly doesn't work on most of the devices that our new customers own. So. It's a whole bunch of stuff to do with that. So um, this is a talk about how we went about moving steadily in a business sensitive way from a really big works actually quite well flash application to, to um, an HTML5 React application. If you go to our website today, you won't see the React application. We're going to be bringing it out. So um, the key thing to say is that this talk may contain a live demo of beta software. Um, in an untested production environment. I was hoping to show you a more updated beta, but I can't get on a VPN, so I can't show you what will be live on Monday if you know where to go. Um, so what's the problem? What are we actually doing here? 
Uh, we're helping people build beautiful things, and today we're doing it in Flash. Flash is horrible. Flash is terrible. Uh, um, Flash also has fantastic font reproduction and is super consistent across lots and lots and lots of browsers. And um, lots of our customers really care that when they make a business card that looks like that on the screen, um, that when it arrives in the post, it's got the right font on it, that it's got the right kerning on it, it's got the right typography on it, all that kind of a lucky. Um, it would be lonely if we could just you know, throw up a form, type in some stuff, bang it out, ship it to you. If there's any bugs, we fix it afterwards. But the other kind of problem that we have is that um, on some level, if we show it to you with a bug here, maybe you wanted that. Maybe you wanted to clip your text off the side of your card because that's artistic. Maybe any one of a number of things. So it's very important to us that what you see here is what you get. Um, and the web is a brilliant thing, but it's designed for progressive enhancement which is the very opposite of exactly what you see on screen. It's exactly what you're going to get everywhere. So that's a challenge. Um, the other thing that people don't like to mention about Flash is that it's actually got pretty good tooling in a lot of different places. You know, It's got nice statically typed language. You fire up IntelliJ. You put big root factor. You change stuff. It tells you you broke this in loads of places. Um, that's kind of handy. And we had a lot of it. We had about 120,000 lines in one application at the beginning of the year, um, supporting what seems like a fairly straightforward thing. Uh, but if you consider all the validation and all the changes and everything that go into that to help you understand what you're going to get, there was lots of stuff. We have been talking years and years and years, lots of developers banging on this thing, loads of features, loads of stuff in there. Mission critical. It's kind of the heart of our business. You come to Move. The thing that you want to do is you want to buy stuff. To buy stuff, you go through this big Flash application. It's not something where we can just whack something up and check it through. So, uh, we are, so, this is not a to-do app. This is not to-do <laughs> NPC, right? This isn't like, you know, I've done a little demo and I've got, you know, a completely flat data structure that's super simple and, you know, woo! Um, it's not any of that stuff. That this is, we're talking about uh, complex rotated text, precise image positioning, uh, ending up in print where it costs us money every time we have a bug. It costs us money every time somebody doesn't get what they expect. Um, you know, there's all sorts of interesting designs, not just slap an image on the back. Um, you've got fun things here where we're talking a bit about components and where lots of things are looking at state. You change something up top here, the thumbnail changes. If there's an error, validations appear elsewhere. As you add data, lots of stuff reacts to what you're doing. Um, so this is a sort of fairly big application. So there's 120,000 lines weren't bloat. That was 129 lines after we'd done a lot of refactoring. We did a lot more. We got down to like 95, and that was about as far as we could go. And that was already beginning to kill people. Um, and this was not our first attempt to move across and move all Flash and move into HTML5. We were lots of smart people, all of whom spent all of their time running HTML and JavaScript. They wanted to do that. Um, we weren't kind of sitting around going, no, Flash is wonderful, and we can't make a business case for it. We knew that we wanted to move to HTML5. We just it took us a couple of goes to get here. So way back in 2012, um, we started moving bits of that big Flash application into this exciting hybrid where you had master master on the data model. So you would edit stuff in the Flash and then master master that over into the HTML where you would do a whole lot of image partner manipulation stuff and that would master master back into the Flash. Sounds kind of crazy, was kind of crazy. Um, actually worked reasonably well, but still sounds kind of crazy, was kind of crazy. Um, we also started to try and build a whole build flow in HTML5 and JavaScript. Um, at the time, we were using Backbone. We were using mustache and handlebars. We were trying to do it well. We tried, anybody here ever tried to use Marionette and that kind of thing, where you've got lots of nested views and you've got lots of nested data structures? How many of you spend lots of nights trying to work out what's going wrong? Okay. So the interesting thing was that actually mirrored quite closely what we saw in Flash. The truth is, if you've got a big complicated application on, on screen, you're changing stuff here, and stuff changes all over the place. You've got animation, you've got timing, you've got data being manipulated in deep trees. It's just hard. Like, it's really just hard. No matter what tools you use, it just sucks. You're adding an event listening here to some, to some component, no matter where that component is done in you know, Polymer, or if that component is done in HTML, that component is done in Marionette. It's just I'm changing six things about this, and all of a sudden I've got 62 events because this fires and something's changed. So I'm firing an event and I'm listening, and I have no idea what's going on in my application. You know, CPU software architects are going, I'm kind of burning out. The junior devs are going, I'm not working on that. They're just working on right? So it gets really hard to hire. It's a horrible problem. Um, 
I like I like to give the positive side of things, you know, it's important. <laughs> um, so though this stuff is just challenging. And, and, and the short version is that state is nightmare. Somebody asked about state, right? Who who everyone here writes sort of deals with web applications, right? Who like who's been doing this for a while and has written a CGI web application? All the way back, right? At the happy day, right? I got a web page. Boom. Someone types some stuff into a form, they hit post, goes to my thing. I've got a, an application that goes, take my form in. Cool. Uh, make SQL statements. Send SQL statements to the database. Update table. Blah. Comes back, send back to client, redirect to page. Client comes back. OK, what's happening? Well, I have no idea what happened in the past. I'm a goldfish. I ask the database, what does the world look like? It says, the world looks like this. I go, cool. I rent you out a page. I send it back to you. How many bucks do you have? Almost none. State problems, gone. Super easy. Really nice. Really wonderful. That's React. Right? So you've got a whole lot of data somewhere, and you've got a whole lot of HTML at the side that looks like you're writing HTML. So I disagree about the sort of like, you know, using another thing that hides away the XML, because it looks like the HTML that I'm writing anyway. Like, I know what that looks like. I look at the, you know, when I'm looking at the, the element, uh, the, 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 um, yeah, the elements tab in Chrome, where I'm going through in Firebug, and I'm looking at my tree. No trees. I just spend my life doing trees. All right, CSS that modifies trees. Like, I get that stuff. Everyone on the team gets that stuff. React just makes that my application. And all you do is I've got some data. It comes in here as props. I do some render stuff. I maybe call a couple of other things. And that says, here's your HTML. Something changes. SQL update statements. That's what Flux is, right? Send a thing through saying, change the world by following. Then the world has changed, and I hear it again. That's kind of what it is. So that's so much easier to work with. So it's talking about not knocking what works. With our Flash application, we had all of the stuff. We had really good guarantees. We had um, clean, easy to understand data models once we you know, started doing a bunch of work on that. Um, but we had a ton of pain as well, the same pain that we had in JavaScript. Lots of event handlers and lots of objects, lots of state changes. Um, a good example, you know, another thing that databases make super simple. Um, one of the things that you can do when you're, when you're buying cards from Move is that you can, uh, it's a feature that our designers and our customers and our product managers love, right? You get a card like this, and there's another pack sort of like it, and you can, you can flip one change here, and you can change theme. <laughs> you can change theme, right? So you can go from red to blue, but it's not just red to blue. It's different artwork. It's different fonts. It's different colors. Whole data model changes across all of my stuff. Um, in the Flash application, this was killer, right? Because all of these data models are directly bound onto these view objects that are being represented all over the show. So I go and I make this change, but now, okay, so now I've changed the image box of this image, the image view. Okay. Now I switch the resource URI. That image isn't loaded. <laughs> Crash. Okay, let's try this again. Now I have to tell this data model, please stop paying attention to the change, etc., etc., etc. We were doing it all in, um, uh, in Pixel in our new HTML5 editor. That's super simple. Old data model, function of old data model, new data model, redraw, done. Last time we did it, and one of our senior devs took about a month and a half to get that right, mostly not crashing most of the time. It took us two days to do with React, and that included testing that in a couple of extra days. So where did we get to? And so again, I would apologize. I'm going to do a live demo in a moment, and I hope that that works fairly well. Um, but where we got to is an application that is feature parity or slightly better than what we had, written in HTML5, JavaScript, works beautifully on desktops, looks pretty well on tablets, we're still doing some work there. It's pretty darn fast, though we've only spent a day and a half performance optimizing it, so if we get any bugs, we're, when we get bugs, we'll go back and we'll make it faster. Um, and is really a high fidelity. We did a couple of bits of cheating, so there is a lot of stuff done on the server side. So we'll do lots of server side rasterization using all sorts of exciting, boring tech like Java, PDF. Uh, but it works really reliably and it's really quite quick. Um, and it works really well. So let's see if I can do a live demo. Or should I save the live demo for the end? We can talk a bit more. Up to you guys. Great. Demo. <laughs> Bearing in mind that the last time I touched the computer, everything stopped yeah, working. Work. So let's see if I can get this to work. And sure. Right. Cross. Okay, is that showing up on the screen share? Uh, yeah. Yeah, but not very big, right? Let's see if that's better. Oh, good. So. 
this is our flash This is our HTML5 application. So as you come in, you're looking at a pack of business cards that you could order. You can go in, select your text. You can tab between the fields. You render, and as you can see, bugs notwithstanding, you can change your stuff. You can go in here, you can set an image from our image library, put that in. Again, a couple of small bugs. Um, feature software, live demo. <laughs> what an excellent <laughs> combination. Uh, let's see if rotating it makes it better. No, rotating it is not making it better. OK. Come up. And you can see that's what it should look like on the other side. And as I said, we've made a number of change, a number, there we go, a number of improvements in the last two weeks. So now I can go in, I can select this image, I can drag it around. Uh, let's get an error. Let's get it wrong. Because when you cut, well, this is one of those things I was talking about. Customers actually come and they make stuff. And so when we make these cards, we don't print it this side. We print it a little bit bigger and we cut it so it's exactly right. The problem with that is you've got to explain to people that there's all sorts of edges and bleeds. And you've got to do a whole bunch of validation, things like this. Where you come in and say, oh, there's a problem. Here's the problem. Here's some explanation. Um, you can flip over. You can look at all these backs. So there's a whole bunch of backs. And if this was on the more recent version, you'd see a whole lot of animation at this point. It would be very cool. And I would do a shout out to Stephen Brown. who did fantastic work on that. Um, you do stuff here. You go back up to your pack. And then ultimately, because you're a good, happy customer, you spend some money. Um, you click I'm done. And you go through and you can buy. Now, the previous application that we had took Four months to deliver, sorry, the Flash application way back when, 2011, took about four or five months to deliver the initial version um, and has been continuously updated since then. We've done this in five months, including design, prototyping, iteration, and delivery. Now, we've done a lot of work in the previous few years, but that's still pretty fast. And I'd say now we're really cranking in features we never thought were possible with the old Flash application we've been starting on soon. So that's our application. So as I said, this is not to do MVC. So things that went well. I'm going to be a little bit honest. There's a couple of things down at the end which things didn't go well, or more specifically things we haven't worked out how to do well yet. Some of them lie up with the stuff we've talked about. So the first is this idea that you know I've got a bunch of data. And, and that data is not only my customer but there's a little bit of information there about how the screen is. What page am I on? Um, what have I selected? What have I not selected? All of that kind of stuff. Just so we can give, you know, we can send the same information through the loads of different components um, and get and draw out, OK, this is what the screen looks like now. Um, that works phenomenally well. And like an undervalued bit of this is that all your event finding onto what bits of the DOM you want to listen to at any given time, um, that's all done in the same place. And, Kind of, it looks really like 1999, right? Like on-click handlers in my HTML. This is evil. It's terrible. It cleans it up. It sorts it out. And actually, the truth is, from a developer point of view, the reason the on-click handlers were in the HTML in the first place was really obvious. Um, and the older I get, the more I've you know, sort of moved up towards the software architect side, the more that I really like really obvious, simple things from a developer point of view. I'm stupid. I'm going to be stupid at 2 in the morning. Actually, I'm not going to be so stupid at 3 in the afternoon when I code a really awesome feature. But when CS calls me at 2 in the morning to say that our American customers can't order something because I was clever, or you know, somebody on my team was clever and I'm trying to work it out, I like stupid. I like stupid lots. Um, so display being a simple function of data is a really great thing. The future being a function of the past is also a really awesome thing. So, you know, with the unit testing type stuff, um, you know, I've got some data and I've got a simple function, and the only thing that changes the output of that function is the stuff I pass in at the top. Um, I don't need like complicated mocks. I don't need um, a whole lot of weird fixtures. I don't have to have huge libraries of old stuff. I don't have to test that if I change it to this and then I change it to that, is the output different? No, because the output is put the stuff in the top, it goes to the hopper, it comes out right or it comes out wrong. This is like the act, every demo test case starts looking like the test cases you're actually writing. That's awesome. Like that's really fantastic. And so this is where kind of the functional programming thing isn't something that clever people do. It's the thing that I'm going to encourage the team to do because it makes it really easy to read your, your co-worker's code, it makes it really easy to reason about what the hell's going on, it makes it super easy to fix bugs. As long as you can stay in, as much of your code as you can fit in that world, it's a very happy place. 
Um, good data structures make things much easier. So the other thing that happens with, so one of the things that kind of can be a bit, bit difficult with the immutability thing, and this is one of those tensions that runs around all over the show, is um, this battle between, I've got hashes and I've got lists and I don't need anything else, right? Like, it's awesome. I can go in and I can make anything I want in JSON. It's cool. Um, and then when I need something new, I can just add a property somewhere. Awesome. Okay? Um, and then later on at 3 in the morning when the US calls to say, why is this not happening for these customers here? I have no idea why some junior added in a new property in this particular place just to pass it across to that thing over there. Um, so good data structures are really nice in terms of, a, being able to have a clear structure to what data is flowing around your code. I've got a lump of stuff that looks like this. Moving it from here to here, these are the properties that are on it, and here's how you change it. Uh, obviously, in addition to that, you also want really rich, really fast, immutable data structures. So how many people here are wondering, so immutable stuff means you've got a new copy every time you change anything. How many people are wondering how that's fast? No one? Awesome. Great. Everyone's watched watch for a chicky. I can be right with <laughs> Anyway, to add to the list of things, we've got a thing called Basilisk, which we wrote. Um, it's a lot like the other immutable data structure libraries out there. The two things that it does that I haven't seen the others do is, one, it gives you a struct idea. So I've got a struct. I say, hey, I've got a struct. It's got these properties. And it goes, OK, here's an easy way for you to derive new data from the old ones. So if I've got, you know, like using my example earlier, I've got a, a side that represents all the text on this card, um, and somebody changes this line over here, then I've got an easy way to say, well, give me a new version that's just like this version that has changed that particular line. And you can do that nice and, in nice, deeply listed things. You can do it in a way that's easy to reason about. Um, you can do it in a way that's nice and fast. Um, so that's kind of handy. Um, and that turns out to be the kind of key idea. So when people were asking about Flux earlier, and for those who are uncertain about Flux, Flux is effectively a lot like your database. You've, you've got this big data store. All of my data lives over here. Um, and effectively, what you do is you say, uh, well, the way that we do it is there's a, you know, that, that is all wrapped by an object, and that object has a single method on it called swap. And what do you do with the swap function? You say, hey, I'm giving you a function of the current state of the data. data and once you run it, it'll return you the new state of the data. Okay? And then when you're done, please call my re-render method, because that's things nice people do. Um, and it turns out that becomes a really, that's a really easy pattern. You know, I've got all of my component code out here, and then I've got some functions which operate on the core data structure, not tied to my components at all, they're just some functions. And I can choose which ones I call, and I can carry some values onto it. It's just a fancy way of saying adding a bunch of arguments to a closure, and pass it back up, and pops your rock. Um, Basilisk has some utilities for doing that with your data structure. If you want to change something, you know, if I've got the side and the side is part of a pack and the pack is part of an order, um, then I don't want to have to go, you know, give me a new order that contains a new side that contains a blah, blah, blah. I can just go run a swap operation on this thing all the way down here and just change that and then give me a new one of the whole lot, please. So there's some utilities on there which we find quite handy. The next thing is there's a whole lot going on, as you may have seen. You know, when you're, you're dragging an image around on a side, um, there's lots of stuff happening there. We've got a simple data model, which is, you know, I've got some text and an image on a card. So that's pretty straightforward. But the display we're giving you has got loads of hints. You know, so there's all sorts of matrix math to go on, okay, exactly what's the position of all the stuff. And, you know, you've got rotated text going on, and you've got shadows going on, and you've got occlusion and clipping and all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, so there's all of that happening, and it's still really fast. The first version of this thing, um, being really good web developers, we mostly sit and muck around in Chrome and Safari. Um, and so it was super fast, like really nice, great, and then the QA comes back and kind of sucks in IE. <laughs> um, OK, so the simple thing about React is that, you know, 60% of the time it works every time, right? I mean, it's super fast, and if you're not doing anything where you really notice a little bit of animation delay, it's going to work great. Still leaves your mobile and IE. Um, and it makes it quite easy. So the should component update stuff is really not that complicated to understand. It says, listen, you're going to have the following props in a second. Will anything really ever change? Right? And if it's the same set of information as the last time, you just say no. And then nothing under you has to update. So at the very top level of our application, if the user clicks over here and it goes, has to changed? Um, we just go, no. And then nothing happens. Um, so really simple things like that add an enormous amount of performance. So step one, triple equals, right? All your data is immutable. Then if I've got something that is triple equal, like the exact same object I had before, it hasn't changed. 
can't have changed. There's no way it can have changed if it's immutable. So if everything is a simple immutable object, bang. Step one, done, go home, go to the pub. Your application is fast and no one cares. Like, you don't have to worry. In our case, it's a little bit more complicated. So we've got a lot of calculations going on. So we'll, we'll know at this level that something has changed. So right at the top, we know that the site has changed. We're going to have to redraw a bunch of stuff there. Um, and then we go down and we go, OK, for each item on the side, which one has actually changed? And that's OK. So we've got a thing. And then we want to recalculate. So then the question is, OK, do I redraw all of these hints? Bear in mind, again, it's lots of matrix math. It's lots of kind of calculation stuff. It's just going to take time if I'm doing it 500 times a second. Um, so any Java program or anyone who's done Python or Ruby or anything like that will recognize the dot equals method. That turns out to be really easy. If you've got structures and you can say, well, I'm, I can canonically say that I can check to see if things have actually changed with the dot equals method, this one and this one, this one being a newly created where is this thing supposed to be, um, are actually the same and I can stop right there. So step two is dot equals. We haven't needed a step three. Um, so when we need it, we'll get back to you. But for now, that's fast. We aren't even using request animation frame yet because it just kind of works. Plenty fine on everything that we really care about. As we get more and more into mobile, I think we'll probably do more and more of that. But for now, on all the phones our customers actually use, it's fine. So the next thing is that code structure is sort of same by default. So um, effectively, what you end up with is model, presentation logic, and some pure functions, which would, which would sort of be bound up to a whole bunch of weird controller state. If you've ever done an iOS app or anything that's got like nice long lived state on the client, um, that turns out to give like lots of problems. But all you end up with here is you've got a model, you know, clean, this is my data, this is my customer thing, I can produce a new version of it using some functions, and I've got some views, which are just another set of pure functions. Really easy to go through and look through my code base and say, oh, here are my JSX files, that's mostly UV type stuff, and I've got some utilities and I've got some data models. Code structure is same by default. <laughs> um, that's a huge win over lots of other tools where you know your state your code all and stuff. We don't have a separate templates one little bit. MVC is just um, one way to split it. Uh, you've still got to do all of those things, but this organization works way better for us. So there's lots of things we're still working on. It's not all sunshine and roses, otherwise it would have been a two-month project, five-month project. Um, so this is going to sound odd. So again, because we're being quite aggressive about what we're drawing and how we're drawing and how much are we doing on the client side, polyfills are still a pain in the in the host area, right? Particularly if you're trying to do something more compl complicated, um, and you end up with uh, all of that stuff. This is not you know React specific in any way, but it's still there. It doesn't magically go away. Yeah. For us, SVG is almost right in very different ways in lots of places. So that's been a real pain for us. Um, with React, React doesn't support the full set of SVG, mostly, so you can only use some parts of it. Works fine for a lot of basic things, but you know, if, you, if you're planning on doing very aggressive stuff, we've had to do a little bit more render component to string and then inner HTML than we would have liked in order to get all the SVG stuff to work correctly. So it's a little bit messy. We've had some difficulty with changing SVG objects that kind of thing. Uh, again, this is not specific to React, though actually in some ways React makes it a little bit easier, but magically responsive designs that go from from the designer downstairs, 27 inch iMac to the customer in the US and it's a little phone, um, are just hard. They're just difficult to do. Now the nice thing with React is that you can probably reuse more of that logic than I can think, which certainly would have been able to do in the backbone. But um, it's still something that you challenge. It doesn't magically fix this, this stuff at all. Uh, and async doesn't fit well yet. So again, one of the things that, like, if you go back to that example of the CGI application, right? One of the things that happens is that everything more or less to you looks immutable, and this is and this is the happy case for React. If all of your data is local, you only do stuff local. It's grand. Stuff comes in, I change the state of the DOM. DOM. The very next thing that happens is I've got a new state of the application, and I render that out. When you've got async going on, that's just hard anything you do. So this doesn't magically fix that. There's a bunch of things you can do if you want to get clever and start using actor mount models, and you can use queues of operations to be performed and sent back and forth, and then you do multiplex, blah, 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 blah. Just, we don't have, we haven't found one nice, tidy way of doing it. Um, and generally, uh, what we found is that if you're trying to manage async state inside of a particular React component, um, and then depending on it in some way, so not in a kind of like, okay, 
you've typed in this, so I'm going to load the results, and when I get the results, display it. But if I, if you happen to change it, I'll just discard that request. It's okay. If you're actually trying to reason about stuff over time, it gets super hard. It's just super hard anyway, but it gets a little bit messy with the application. Um, and then undo. This is one of those kind of like you know, poster child uh, features for, for for functional programming, right? Like yeah, the future is a function of the past. You just hold on to both, and you've got undo done. Ship it. Absolutely. <laughs> it's why we don't let engineers make product decisions. It turns out it's harder to get undo in a way that users understand. All the primitives are there, and it's a lot easier than in other things. But it's not magical unless you're making a little demo application about pixels going a couple of places. Like you want to clump things together and do all of that logic, and you know, all the stuff you see in C sharp frameworks. Um, it's very dull, but it's kind of important. Um, and then lastly, when in doubt, have a phenomenal team. You know, I had the privilege of working with some amazing people, and that's made it a whole lot easier. Mm -hmm. Uh, when we'll be flying by the seat of our pants, it's just changing stuff. It's cool. Um, so thank you to everyone. Um, so any questions? Obviously, I have to put the one at the bottom there. If you want to join us, please pick me up. This is part of our um, But uh, seriously, any questions? Uh, yes. Question. Have you ditched like a dispatcher? Like, are you using dispatcher and all this flux idea of dispatcher, or are you basically because you're returning the state? when you do the swap function. They're, they're basically the same idea, right? Yeah. So dispatcher, as I understand it, I mean, I haven't got some huge these up. We kind of we were doing this before they were kind of publishing some of the flux stuff. The dispatcher is kind of, I've got an object and I call some methods on it and I pass some parameters to it and then, and then, and then it changes stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that works really well as long as, it's, it's a bit like an HTTP interface, right? It works really well as long as the methods that I can call map quite cleanly to the things that I can do. And I think that will that stops scaling at a certain point for a single object. It's like basically that becomes a God object. And when it starts looking like a God object, when you've got like 50 methods on there, each map to one thing in your UI, that just gets ugly. And so what we found was having one method on there called swap, and then a whole lot of little functions that we could compose together that would manipulate one part of the data model, and then at an appropriate level, we bind those together into coherent units. That worked better for us. It's the same idea with just, you know, we've got lots of stuff going on. Um, but it's the same basic thing. You've got data flows out, update the database, comes back, to, you do a redirect, comes through the CGI, and gets printed out to the screen um, with lots of animation and sort of that stuff. So the same basic thing. Yeah? Have you ended up inventing everything? Or have you? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, we're using React. We're using a little bit. So, so, so one of the things with JavaScript generally is that people tend to reuse a lot of other people's code. Yeah. Um, and I've found while writing a reasonably complicated React app that I'm finding that difficult to do. Yeah. Obviously, you can tell React that you don't want it to do anything underneath some particular bit of your component tree, and you can tell it to render components. So if you want to do complicated things like use a jQuery sortable object or something like that, then you can kind of unhook bits from up here in the tree and rehook them down further down. But it all tends to become sufficiently painful that you end up just re-implementing everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, so around that, there are not solutions to that. Um, so we are using ever so slight amounts of jQuery inside. So it turns out React is a little bit, it is very correct in a possibly unhelpful way around scroll events, for example. So there's a few places where we do some stuff in the DOM component, component will mount, component will unmount, where we go and we manipulate stuff using jQuery, mostly to listen and then add a little bit of flavor. Um, similarly, we found that, yeah, inside React, using something else, if it's not clean and tidy and kind of dangerously set in our HTML, going and going and like touching a few things from the DOM is okay, but you don't want to do too much. Um, I've been lucky in that I get to wield a big stick and I said, please, no one, is, no one is allowed to let a designer go and read the height of the thing before we go and, you know, not, not only sort of both of them. We do it once for the whole screen, but nobody's allowed to go and read the height of individual components because we're pushing them around there. Um, we, we generally try not to go around React that way. In terms of the sort of broader JavaScript library stuff, we've used a fair bit, but not a huge amount. Similarly, we just find it can be a little bit, you know, we use a lot of tools to produce CSS and things like that, but not so much at the runtime. We tend to write a lot of that ourselves. Um, Basilisk, unfortunately, is something we started writing about eight, two years ago. And then we kind of ran out of steam a bit and sort of picked up again at the beginning of this year, just in time for us to have it just about ready to push, and then all of a sudden they were like five, uh, which is a little bit disappointing. It's still really good. Um, but no, we don't we don't reuse a lot of other people's HTML components because we just find inevitably 
it's kind of cool right at the point the designer gets hold of it, and then all of a sudden you kind of got to redo it all yourself anyway, so you might as well do that from the beginning. And then at least it's easy for you to reason about, and it's all React code. So. I haven't done any kind of data sync with the server or all the time. that kind of stuff, or are you just not doing that? Like, no, we do, we do that all the time. So actually, where I'm typing in there, I'm typing into HTML. And then when I click away, that's re-rendering that um, the Java process in the data center, rasterizing that to PNG and, slice, uh, and sending back the slice of the image that's been modified to us here. So, so you, there's, there's, there's a constant sort of sync of data there. Every time you, you go back to the overview, we save a copy so that you've got this kind of invisible save thing going on. So if you go away and you come back and you're in something in your cart and you go somewhere else, that's just transparent to you as a user. So we are doing a fair bit of sync. Um, I guess what we aren't trying to do at the moment is reading our writes. We either write or we send an um, item open request saying, listen, render me this image at this location. If I ask you to do that again, it's, gonna give, it's the same URL, it's going to be the same output. So, um, preferably, we don't try to send rights that we then read the result of. Um, I mean, you could, but that would be a different application. And thank heavens, I don't have to write that one. That sort of thing gets painful quite quickly. Um, it's easier for us to be master of it. Um, for one thing at a time to be master, rather than having multiple things be master. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yes? I was just wondering, <clears throat> you mentioned that there were some issues uh, with SVG. And I just wondered what that was. Is it like a limitation of the virtual DOM? Um, so one of the things that React does is it sort of, it's by fear, predefines all the HTML elements you can do. You create all your own components, but the elements that it can actually read and write into the DOM, the DOM's a wonderful thing. It provides a uniformly broken interface, right? Mm -hmm. So lots of different elements need to be adjusted in careful ways. Um, and so what React doesn't let you do is just say, well, actually, I happen to know that the browser knows about this element over here, um, and just trust me about that. They add those in, they test them, they add them when they're confident that they work in enough places. Um, with SVG, a lot of the really interesting stuff that we wanted to do with SVG, uh, we know is supported in browsers but isn't supported in the version of it in the set of attributes and properties and everything else that React exports. Um, and so one of the things we found with some filter properties and things like that, Larry and a whole bunch of stuff in this, she can probably tell you more about it, um, that that wasn't really available. So what we ended up doing was creating those SVGs a different way and then getting them into the DOM ourselves. Uh, you know, it was one of those things that we, you know, if, if we start really doing heavy client-side editing and complex files and stuff, We'll just go and find it, and we'll contribute back to React if necessary. But hopefully, you know, they're moving pretty quickly, and they're adding support for lots of new elements as they go. I'm sure this is just a case of I haven't gotten there yet. But that's the kind of thing that we found. And then one of the other things was every now and then we had some problems where we were trying to modify a particular SVG, but I can't remember the specifics. I just remember that somebody was very unhappy after a couple of days, and we mentioned the side wasn't. Can you give a specific example of why they kind of just treat element names as strings? And I mean. I take your word for it. I'm just sure. curious of an example. So, um, it's not so much the element names, it's the attributes. Uh, there are attributes which you've got to touch carefully. Either you've got to access them as attributes, or you've got to go through the JavaScript API, or you've got to go through the CSS API. There's a couple of cases like that. I think scroll is one of them, like scroll top. It's supposed to be an attribute, but it's not really an attribute. And it shows up somewhere like an attribute, but it's really kind of a JavaScript or anything. It's my kind of yeah. fuzzy memory. It's something like that. There are a few um, and so they've kind of done the thing of saying they've got a pit of success. It's there, and it's going to work cool, or it's not there. They don't have this thing where it's there, and <laughs> it's a trap. Um, <laughs> none of that. So which is a really nice thing. Like, the, the, the whole, like, you're trying to have a bit of success in your API is a really <laughs> nice property of what Facebook has Anything else? Yeah. I'm around afterwards for any questions. If you want to go deeper or ask higher level questions, I should usually be able to answer both ends of those. Um, so yeah, thanks very much.
How's that? Yeah. Yeah, it looks looks better now. Yeah. Right. It might be because I minimized it, so I won't do that. Yeah, they're watching too. Right, well, 
Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Robbie McCorkle. I'm a UI developer at Red Badger here. Robbie. Robbie. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I should have should have probably written my name on the slide. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, Firebase actually, and how I think it works really well with React. And for most people I talk to, Firebase is actually not something they've heard of, or maybe they've heard of it, but they never really thought to try it or something like that. And actually, I haven't even delved too far into it. I kind of keep coming back to it, and every time I come back to it, I'm kind of surprised by how uh, neat it is. Um, so what is Firebase? It's a back-end as a service service. <laughs> um, in that um, it takes over all of your need to really create a backend um, if you can put up with a few sacrifices. Um, so it kind of handles your database and it has an API that lets you access that data. Um, but its party trick is that it does really, really easy live syncing of your data um, from your Firebase data store to your app. Um, and it syncs with lots of sort of events that kind of work with React quite nicely. Um, so I've only actually done two slides because I think the rest of the talk should just be a demo. Um, and I'm not doing a to do MVC, <laughs> but I'm almost doing a to do MVC. I asked my, one of my friends about this, and he suggested a good thing uh, to do with Firebase and React would be a live blog um, because actually it's kind of live blog is something you really do want live sync. Um, which I think is a great idea. So the challenge is we have a template that doesn't have very much in it, and we're going to try and build a live blog in this book. Can, hmm? can you please share the screen? Can you please share the screen? And there's a present. Uh, hang on. Ooh, we are sharing a screen. Yeah. Yep. And just Inception is infinite loop. How's that doing? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. No, I don't have a photo shot. That's not what I wanted. Okay. <laughs> All right, so in the sublime. So here's our template. This is just a top-level React component. Um, so there's a couple of things I need to mention about this, this template. Um, I'm writing it inside uh, another template, I guess, uh, you want to call it, um, which Stu talks about at a previous um, React meetup. He mentioned it just now. Um, which is that it's something we've got that allows us to run React applications on the uh, server side and the client side. Really nice. Um, all of the features that are built into this template um, for this project we actually don't need at all. The only reason I'm using it is because I couldn't be bothered to create my own project. <laughs> um, I just thought I'd just build it on this one. But pretty much the only thing we have to worry about is this is uh, the React component that's going to be pretty much all of our done. Um, so uh, we've got a render method. Um, I've got two div um, uh, sort of containers because I've got a uh, bootstrap CSS in here. And I want the demo to look pretty because you know I can't be doing with a, a non-pretty demo. Uh, it's just not allowed. Um, and I've got an H1. Um, so it looks like this. And if I refresh, it still works, which is amazing. I was running through this last night, and pretty much every step I pressed refresh and it broke <laughs> because I just kept forgetting stuff. So I'm going to be checking that it's working uh, every step of the way. Um, I also, when I was uh, when I was making this presentation, it was like middle of the night last night on a coffee rampage. So I need some <laughs> notes to just uh, make sure I'm, I'm not missing anything. Um, all right, so, right, so before we talk about Firebase at all, I think we just need to crack on and start building uh, a really sort of simple live blog um, uh, template. So uh, first thing we're going to need is a form uh, and a text. Array. So we're going to create a form. Uh, notes. Um, and that form is going to need uh, an on spent um, method. Um, so another thing I forgot to mention is obviously we're using TypeScript again. We really like TypeScript, um, doing TypeScript in the project. Um, if you want to know anything more about this template that renders things on the server side and the client side, then ask me. Don't ask me. Um, <laughs> it's much better. And if you want to le learn more about React um, written in TypeScript, then ask you. That's probably. Um, but um, if you're wondering, uh, a do statement here just um, 
defines a block, basically, a block in, in JavaScript. Um, so we're just passing arguments to this um, form component. Um, quite often, if I'm uh, writing this stuff on an unsubmit uh, uh, method, I'll probably um, put in an anonymous function and um, do some of my logic in there. Uh, for now, I'm going to actually um, uh, reference a, another function above, um, because it's going to make things a bit neater um, later on. Um, so I'm going to say is a function. Arrow in LiveScript means function, by the way. Um, OK, so inside our form, uh, we're going to need a text area to actually write stuff in. So the first child of this element is there we go. Um, I'm going to say do for that as well. Uh, and that needs a value. So we're using the usual um, uh, React paradigm of uh, the sort of value of a text area always goes to a state. Um, so we're going to say state dot text. Um, and then on the, uh, right here. Um, and on the on change event um, of this text area, um, we're going to do this through another function at the top. Okay. Uh, final thing we need in our form is a button. We need to be able to submit our form. So let's create the button. It's on the same level as the text area. Um, we have to write null here. You've seen it on the H1. Um, in LiveScript, if you don't have any arguments that you want to pass back to your uh, uh, DOM element, then you do have to write null. Um, it might be a little bit annoying, but I guess at least it's explicit. Um, and some text on the button. Cool. Okay. So let's see if this works. It does. Hooray. Um, I think <laughs> I missed out. Um, I haven't initialized the state, so we've got to say get initial state. And our initial state for the text is going to be empty string. That's all we have to do for it. See what that does. Cool. OK, we've got a light block. Not really. But we have a text area, and we probably won't be able to type anything. There we go, because we haven't filled in those methods for uh, changing. One more thing I had to do, I, I said that this thing's got to be pretty. Um, There's all of these bootstrap classes that I have to remember, and I can never remember them. Uh, that's where I go on the button. There we go. Beautiful. OK, so we want to be able to type into this uh, text area. So on the, in the on change, and yeah, OK, so in the on change, all we have to do is we say set state. Um, and at in LiveScript just means this, or this dot. Um, and we are going to say, <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Keep chatting about the typos. Um, we're going to say text is it dot value, no, dot target dot value. Um, and that's another live script oddity. It just means the first kind of default argument passed into a function. So if you haven't named anything, it is just the first argument. Um, in this case, it's the event. Uh, so that should set our state, and hopefully you now we can type it into the text field. Right. Okay. Um, so uh, finally, we want to fill in this on submit. Uh, first thing we're going to do is put an epoch on the event uh, because we don't have what our form submitting. Um, and then we also want to set the state. Um, and for now, we only have one state, which is the text. Uh, and we're going to reset it to an empty string. OK, so we have, we've got a form, brilliant. But we want to be able to display posts that we type into this form. Um, so we're going to need another state. Um, so we're going to make another state called posts, and we're going to make an empty array for, for the initial state. Um, and we can, a nice little um, sort of thing we can do at live switch is we can put some sort of cool functional stuff right in the middle of the DOM. So to make this fairly good looking, we will say we'll put in a horizontal rule. 
Um, and then we will need another order to list. And then for inside this under order list, we'll obviously have to leave lots of list items, one for each uh, post that we have. Um, so we're going to say state of posts. And then we can actually pipe this, um, uh, this object into a function that's provided by a framework called Preloop, which is a sort of standard library for TypeScript. And that function is going to be mapped. So map's going to go through every uh, item in our list, and it's going to um, output something we tell it inside a function um, for every item in our list. And those are going to be list elements. So we say do. Uh, and inside that is um, it. That's it. Um, uh, and then finally, uh, on the on submit of our form, um, we also want to add the text that we just had um, in our text area to um, to the array. So we can say uh, posts is state dot posts uh, plus plus state dot text. So in one final swoop, we're setting the state. We're setting the text in the text would be blank, and we're adding the post to um, uh, to the end of our array. So let's refresh this and see what we get. Type something, hit submit, not to Why have we just done Did that just disappear? Yeah, I was too. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. I did do a, here's something I made earlier, in case this screwed up. Hmm. I'm just setting the text to early before you know if you that after. I don't know. Say again, say Maybe the text needs to be aligned on and setting it to early? Or is that not Does the list need null the alignments in the list? Uh, uh, null the attributes try to see in post and see if we get them. It's an example post. Say. If you put an example post in, you'll be able to see if it's a render problem or your state problem. True. Yes, we can say tests like, like that. Are you missing a null on the lead? Yeah, I'm yeah. No, we're saying do on the lead. Yeah, yeah, but does the null need yeah, to be null? Yeah, so null. Because it needs to be attributes. Yeah, because it needs to be attributes. Because it's explicit. Null for the tops. So you can do that in the form and the text area. Null for do. And it's, it's, okay. yeah, it, no, it's the first thing. Oh, this, right, so you're, if you're using do and you yes. don't have any attributes, that's going to be head programming. So I do is wrong. Right. So there are some oddities with the, with the live script um, that you can get used to. <laughs> 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 Oh, yeah, yeah, I was going to show everything. Right, OK, so we've got posts coming up. Great, OK. But this talk is about, um, it's about Firebase. Uh, one last thing I might do is I might reverse this array before it goes in, so you'll post the nearest post at the top. Um, so you can actually just pipe that into another function, so reverse, and then map that. So now when we type stuff, it should be over top. We'll just get rid of this time. <coughs> okay, so so we have some form of light block. We can keep posting things in here, but you know, obvious problem. We hit re refresh. There's nothing there. We need some kind of backend. We need a database. So this is where Firebase comes in. So the process of creating a backend in Firebase is pretty ridiculously easy. The homepage has some pretty cute things. It's got all this kind of interactive stuff that you can play around with and sort of chat applications work, um, which is quite nice. Um, I'm just going to log straight in. And the first screen you're presented with um, just gives you a list of your, your backends, pretty much. That sounds weird. Um, you can see I've got this Brad Firebase test. So that's the, is what I did earlier, in case it's screwed with that. Um, but let's create a new, uh, new backend, so let's take a demo. Here around. Probably used that before. Okay. <coughs> okay. So we've created create an application on the back end. Um, now we can go in and we presented with a screen that Firebase causes the calls Forge. Um, 
So the database in Firebase is essentially just a JSON block. It's really, really simple, which you know, could be quite limiting. But for a lot of cases, you know, I, I kind of recommend Firebase as more of a prototyping tool. I don't know what it's like to use in production. It'd be quite interesting hearing from you know, anyone who has used it. Um, but for a lot of cases, when you are just messing around with UIs and you need a backend, a JSON block is kind of what you need. Um, and we can directly manipulate the database in this porch. So we can create a posts uh, object in here. And instead of adding a value, we're going to add uh, a post. One of the sort of weird oddities of this porch thing is you kind of you, you want each of the objects within um, to have a unique ID. Um, I didn't expect the earlier base, um, which it does when you add objects in JavaScript through your application. In the forge, you can't do that, apparently. I've dug through Stack Overflow everywhere. Apparently, it's not great for you guys to use, but whatever, that's fine. Um, so we'll add a dummy host. And that's it. That's pretty much our back end created. We've kind of done the equivalent of spinning up a server, setting up the back end through code setting up web sockets to present changes to our application, uh, setting up the database, even if it is just a no JSON block, it's no SQL thing. We're done. We basically don't need to look at the Firebase website um, ever again. We can navigate through our database by using the URL on here. So if I say posts, it's going to take me straight to my posts. And actually, this URL is what we're going to use inside the app to communicate with our backend. Right, so let's hook this all up into our live blog. Check it OK. So first thing we need to do is we need to initialize a, uh, a Firebase object. Firebase um, uh, provides this, this API that you can, you, know, you can include it as a, your script tags at the top. Um, this template runs all through NPM, so we can just uh, sort of install it into our application using NPM and then require it at the top here. Um, so that means if we create a uh, component will mount method, component mount, um, we first of all, we want to create a global variable, Firebase ref. Um, we can just say new Firebase. And we pass it um, that URL that we just copied. Um, and that gives us a reference to our database in the back end. Kind of done. Um, that Firebase reference that then, then is created just provides a load of different uh, uh, methods that we can then call to do things to our database. You know, it's obviously not going to immediately give us the, um, the data itself. Um, one of the first ways you access the data is all through events. Um, so we can say by this ref, um, and they have their own on function, a bit like um, jQuery. And um, one of the events is called uh, child paddock, which you can imagine the obvious, this obvious thing that this does is if uh, an object is added into your database, it's going to fire this event, and you can do something with it, i.e. add it to your posts. Um, but it's a slightly strange name because it, what it also does is when Firebase first initializes in your app, it's going to call child added for every um, item in your database at the beginning. So you can still kind of um, pick up everything uh, on your first render um, using this. Um, so um, we want one argument. Um, in LiveScript, we don't need to name our first argument. We can use it. Um, but I think occasionally it's use useful. Um, in the documentation for Firebase, they often talk about having data snapshots, which I guess is a kind of important distinction. It's not really your data. It's just a snapshot of the data that's presented at this moment in time um, when the event is called. So when a child is added um, in your Firebase, um, all we have to do is update the state, basically. Um, so we do something similar to what we saw before. We say set state, um, and we say posts is posts um, plus plus uh, the text, which is data snapshot dot function. So you're calling the function val, and it gets um, 
the value of the data for this particular chunk. So we just concatenate that onto, um, onto our post array. Um, technically, if we are working with Firebase or want to be clean, um, we can say component or unmount, and we can tidy up that reference uh, by saying Firebase ref uh, dot off, and then we can sort of clean it up after ourselves when, when the component unmounts. So we added um, one bit of data into our posts. Uh, so let's see. See if it breaks. It doesn't break. It's not just It's really annoying. Um, so, what have we done? Now? Five is only two. Does fire events for all children at startup, or do you have to? <laughs> it does for all children at startup. I've just realized. Can't read properly post of undefined. That's another uh, kind of interesting thing. So we're using this um, by using the at symbol in LiveScript, uh, but we don't have the right scope. Um, so we can't actually access set state. And there's a handy thing for that in LiveScript. Instead of using an arrow to create a function, we can use a curly arrow. Uh, and that essentially does the sort of dollar this equals this for us. Um, it just sets the scope to the outer scope for us. So I think that should fix that one. OK, we've got our data. Um, and that's, that's pretty awesome. You know, we have very little setup on our back end. We didn't really do much here. And we're already getting data from a server. Um, so the last thing we want to do is be able to send data to Firebase. Um, and again, we don't need to fiddle around with our DOM at all for this. We just want to uh, change our onSubmit function. And that's all going to work through our Firebase packets as well. Uh, so, I'm just grabbing my notes here so I guess wrong. Alright, so we're preventing default as usual. Um, that was it. It's So, on our Firebase reference, uh, there's a function just called push, uh, which pushes, pushes an object onto uh, the reference that we defined. Um, so, uh, we can, in a similar way to set state, we just pass an object, we say state text, state dot text. Uh, and then we don't need to set state down here. We're kind of bypassing setting state in React. We're kind of pushing it through to Firebase and then setting the state when everything comes back to us. So, we want to get rid of that. Uh, and we just set state on the text field to make sure it clears out. Um, so, let's give that a try. We've got text. I think it's nice to be here. It appears. Okay, that's pretty cool. So, is this really working? Let's open a new window. The moment of truth. Okay, so if we were to type something into one of these windows, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty cool, right? I mean, you know, we just created a live blog in what, maybe 10 or 15 minutes? Um, so, there's a final thing we want to talk about. So, the guys at um, Firebase, they have plugins for everything you can imagine. We're using this sort of the raw JavaScript API here, um, but they've got special um, sort of plugins and APIs for Angular and I think probably Ember, and they've just released a mixing for uh, React. May, I think. Um, so, we can't end this talk without actually looking at the React mixing that they provided to us, and it's called React Fire. And what they say they're trying to do with React Fire is just remove a lot of boilerplate code, specifically um, this, this on child added. Um, I guess, you know, when you, when you start to create a large project, you could end up having this kind of stuff in a lot of different places. Um, and it might look um, it might look messy after a while. Um, so let's see what we have to do with that. I think it's probably worth mentioning at this point before we start playing with, with mixins that this is this is why I included Firebase in this talk, or why I did this talk with Firebase. Um, because I think it really complements well 
um, the sort of the sort of paradigms that that React has set up. You know, we have all of this sort of one-way binding and data trickling down through a sort of component hierarchy and updating. And the way I see this is that it's kind of just another level of one-way binding. You have your component hierarchy that React has created, and this kind of just sits on the top. And you're not sort of doing you know, explicit binding that you would in, in Angular. You're just, whereas React says, the data just changed, re-render. You know, the data looks like this, the view looks like this. Um, Firebase is sitting on the top saying, well, your data in the database has changed. You know, do something about it. And uh, React re-renders. And I think it just kind of, you know, it's like, yeah, the one-way binding is just, it's just stretching slightly higher to your database. And it all kind of works in the same way. I think that's, that's really neat. Um, but with the mixing, we're going to get a little bit more, uh, slightly more tightly bound. I'll be really interested to see what you guys think about this, because I'm, I'm not 100% sure if I like it. So we're going to add the mixing, uh, which is called the next file. And this um, gives us a certain number of global variables that we can play with. So in the component will mount method, um, we've got this method called function uh, bind to array. And we can pass this the same Firebase reference uh, that we created earlier. We put this in brackets. Uh, and then we just uh, give it a name for the, array, for the array that we want to create. We don't need this reference anymore. Um, so yeah, that's essentially going to do kind of what exactly what we would expect it to do. It's going to create an array called posts, and it's going to make it a state, and it's going to kind of take all of that um, handling away from us. And because we've done this, um, we just we don't need any of this. We don't need everything. <laughs> um, because it's going to handle everything for us. Now, well, no, I'll get, I'll get on to why I'm not sure about it. Let's get it to work. Um, I presume you don't need unmounts either. Hmm? You don't need the unmounts either. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. We don't, we're not using the fiber strap anymore. It's completely gone. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, and then fire and the push. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so actually, yeah, so now uh, it's created a variable for us called Firebase Refs, and we pass it um, the name of our reference. So it's not actually kind of doing it directly to our state. Um, we still have to uh, yeah, play around with the state slightly, but we don't care about one explicit Firebase Ref. Um, let's try it. No. <laughs> not something we're going to have to do. Mm, This is one of the problems with the um, server-side rendering, is it's not always um, uh, easy to do. Doesn't have method bind to array. Bind as array, that's why. I made it up. Yeah. Oh, so it's all bad. No, we'll talk about it later. Because it's going to. Firebase is not defined. Oh, right. Yeah, OK. Right. <laughs> so I've dug myself into a bit of a hole here because uh, because we're using this template. It does the server side rendering and client side rendering and stuff like that. But for some reason that I cannot fathom, uh, the mixing doesn't work server side. I don't know if it has some problem with node or I've missed something entirely. I don't know why. So uh, a quick fix for now is you say if of if you know like that. I don't like it either, <laughs> but it's something. It's a quick fix that can uh, work for us for now. Can you put it in component did now? Mm, yeah, let's give that a go. No, I don't. 
No, no, no. Right, let's give it a go. Let's I thought it did not honey wrestle. Oh, I see what you mean, yeah. Yes. It's still this. I don't know, it's just some idea. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that works. <laughs> but yeah, so we're, you know, we're restricting the client side. Don't know why we have to do that. All right, so it does the same kind of thing as we, um, as we saw the book before. So, that's quite nice, right? You know, it's it's taking a lot of the work um, away from us, and we're not having to pass around these Firebase maps. And and I guess potentially you could start moving us around. You know, you don't really want these stuff. URLs in your view, you'd probably move that out. The URL out to a config, you might want to uh, move some of this out to a higher component or a router or something, and pass the data in. Um, I think it might give you some more flexibility in that way, but. What I'm not too sure about is how it it obviously is taking away from us the control of what the data uh, looks like on this view side. And one of the one of the things I'd like to do is you know how um, React uh, complains if uh, the children in an array don't have a key. Um, and what I'd really like to do is use those IDs that have been created for us, um, which Showing you that, but yeah, here we go. The post that we created is kind of for us. Um, use that in React as, as a key, um, which you can do when you have manual control over what the data looks like on your views when you're kind of building yourself on these events. Um, as far as I can see on this mixing, it's all just taken away from us a bit too far, and we can't get that. And so I'm, I'm not I'm not too sure about whether this is taking too many things away from us. But maybe on a larger project, it will become really clear that it's cleaning a lot of stuff up and it will be really messy otherwise. So make that what you want. So we've created our um, light bulb. There's one last thing I really want to do. You've seen it um, uh, working between two browsers, which is quite nice. But I mean, this, this doesn't really um, demonstrate um, much more. But I think it would be really fun. fun. Um, we can get this on a public URL. Let's see if this works. So I was playing this last night, and it was throwing some really weird bugs, which mysteriously disappeared, which is the best kind of bugs. Because I have no idea what's wrong. OK, that worked. So what I wanted to do is let's see if you guys can get some posts on the projector. There's your URL. Phones out, laptops out, whatever you want to do. Uh, read it. Jesus, that's small. Yeah, what does that say? It says H J. Just copy and paste it the post. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's go. <laughs> Is that better? H J T B O A R F I H. Local time me. How many rude words can you get on the board in my presentation? Can you read it again. H J T B O R like four F I H. Yeah, there you go. That's awesome. <laughs> um, so there's a little bit of a bug there. We've got text is appearing at the top, but not everything is appearing at the top. Um, so that's a bit strange. But hey, really cool. We've got stuff on a public URL. It's a live updating blog. Um, near enough. Uh, we made it in what? 15 minutes. Not bad. Um, so, yeah, Robbie. Yeah. <laughs> I was expecting rude words. I was expecting like a huge nasty dick. <laughs> um, but you know, we'll, we'll take that away before you do something like that. See <laughs> it. Um, so, last word on Firebase. So, what other features does it have? Actually, I'll jump back in the porch. There's some really cool stuff um, that I quite like. So, it's got um, sort of easy authentication. Um, so. If you like me and you don't want to bother with messing around with OAuth 2 or any of that kind of stuff, um, then it can kind of take a lot of that uh, stuff away from you. And you can do Facebook authentication or email and password or Twitter and stuff like that. I haven't played too much with it, but I understand that it's something you can do. Um, it's got its own hosting, so kind of um, uh, Heroku style, just push it up in the command line and it, uh, it should run. Um, 
Uh, and you can sort of simulate different uh, permissions and see whether some data is available to some users and stuff like that. Uh, I think it goes um, it goes pretty pretty deep. Um, but uh, so what are the disadvantages of Firebase? Well, as I mentioned before, you know it's a JSON blob store, so um, so no SQL kind of stuff. If you want a SQL database, then you're not going to do that. If you're doing some crazy with graph databases, then you probably don't want to use this. And if you're doing something crazy with graph databases, you're probably going to have written your own backend anyway. Um, and um, and well, it's not really a proper backend, is it? It's a it's a database with an API on it. So if you want any more control, you're going to end up with a lot of business logic in your UI code. Which is kind of not too nice, and you know that's going to that's going to get really big and messy. Uh, and the last thing is the pricing. I mean, it's pretty expensive. There's obviously free plans. I can't really translate this in my head to you know how much would this, how many users would you really need uh, hitting a website before you start kind of needing to go up the price ranges. Um, but maybe, who knows? Maybe maybe that is a reasonable price for getting rid of this sysadmin. Um, something like that. Um, <laughs> um, but because of, maybe because of the price, I mean, but either way, I think this is just, um, it's a really good prototyping tool. I think, you know, I said a lot of the people I've spoken to haven't really heard of Firebase, and not only do I think it works, do I think it works really well with React, but I think it's a tool that we can all kind of have in our toolbox to break out, you know, when, when you're a UI developer like me, and you just want to kind of play around with something, and you get hit a wall where you need a back end. Firebase, you can kind of just throw things together really quick and keep kind of prototyping and keep playing. It's kind of fun. Um, one of the things I was thinking about is, you know, going further from this, I thought, well, it would be great if I could have something like this that's a framework that I can just install on my server, not have to pay Firebase any money and just have more control over it. Am I right in saying, folks, that Moped would do that kind of thing? Well, well I think it's probably better. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're interested in that, then go to Confuse yeah, so When it's finished, it, it will do this and more. Awesome. Yeah, okay. Because, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, well, when, you, when you did your talk on Moped, I thought, oh, you know, cool, that's a kind of a Firebase idea, but I can have more control of it. I can have more control of it. So, um, yeah, maybe play with Firebase, contribute to Moped, and get it for free. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I think that, that was pretty fun. I think it's a good, good demo of uh, building, you know, live syncing web apps from. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? I probably won't be able to ask any many questions because I said I can just have it in it, but. Pizza? You got pizza and beer? Does <laughs> 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 so, I mean, so I mean again maybe this is a production thing, but the idea of just having like one JSON blob that represents all your data. Mm. I can't imagine that would be a lot of fun with like a couple of hundred thousand rows yeah, of them right. I mean the, so the, the Firebase API goes pretty deep and I think they they provide a lot of sort of querying methods and I think they're, you know they're trying to make it as much like having a normal NoSQL database would be, I think. You know, I yeah, haven't you know, delved too much into it, but they, they, <coughs> there is quite a lot to it. Um, so I think, um, see, so yeah, I think you can do a lot of querying and obviously authentication kind of stuff. But yeah, as far as just being one blog, you're right, it's kind of makes you nervous. I mean, <laughs> it's a bit weird. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Right. I want a beer. I want more than a beer. <laughs> Um, please, 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 for that question when you get it, um, because the feedback from the first two were actually really useful um, and helped to improve the things as we go on. Um, we desperately need to talk to speakers, so please, please, please come and talk, <coughs> do something, show up what we've been doing. Um, we've got um, a couple lined up next month, but um, there's still slots, so yeah, be brave. Um, and, you know, it's our group, that's what it is. Um, there's most of the people. And, um, 
we can go to the head office or um, have a beer session or whatever. All right, thank you. <laughs>